scripture lesson that you'll see printed there in the bulletin from the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 20 through 36. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks, and they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it. Those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said it was thunder. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that the Messiah remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Jesus said to them, The light is with you for a little longer. Walk while you have the light, so that the darkness may not overtake you. If you walk in the darkness, you do not know where you are going. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become children of light. After Jesus had said this, he departed and hid from them. This is the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So these Greeks show up at the festival, and they come to Philip, and they have one simple request. We want to see Jesus. We want to see Jesus. Church, the world needs you right now. Do you understand that? Church, the world needs you. And the kind of ministry that we're called to offer in these times will only be effective and effectual if we ourselves in our hearts and in our lives together are saying, you know what, we just want to see Jesus. We want to represent Jesus. We want to serve Jesus. We want to offer Jesus into a very troubled world. We begin our sermon series entitled, This Is Us, Real Faith for the Real World. And friends, it starts with a decision to be Christ-centered in who we are, not only as individual disciples, but as the church today. We are called to be a Christ-centered community so that every day... We see Jesus, and people can see Jesus in us. This is our call. So what does it mean? And I've put a little outline there just to keep your attention because there's five points, and I'm going to move fast. I know you're thinking, five points, goodness, don't worry, I'll be moving fast. If you want to take a pew a pencil and a pencil in there, you can, but that will help you to follow along. What does it mean to be Christ-centered? Well, first of all, it means Jesus Christ is in the middle of it all. Jesus Christ is in the middle of it all. Where is God today? Right in the middle of your circumstances. Where is God when you are hurting? Right in the middle of your hurt. Where is God when you are grieving? Right in the middle of your grief. Where is God when violence and tragedy seem to get the upper hand? When people are fleeing for their lives yet again? Where is God? People can say, and legitimately so. But I say he is where he has always been. He's right in the middle. For those who are hurting and grieving and scared and frightened and terrified, God is present. God is present. Beth Spangler says she found herself in the middle of yet another workplace conflict. And she said she was always the one. If there were colleagues who were arguing or in conflict, she was always the one in the middle kind of mediating, trying to work things out, bring people together rather than force people apart. And she was complaining one night on the phone to her mother about this situation. 
I'm right in the middle of it, Mom. I'm trying to get them to work together. I'm trying to sort out the details. And she said, her mom said to her, Beth, nothing's changed. She said, what do you mean nothing's changed? She said, you've always done that. So go with your gift. When kids on the playground would fight, you were always the one trying to work it out and mediate it. When you and your other four brothers and sisters were into that sibling rivalry, you were always the one who was there in the middle trying to work it out. So go with your gift. You're there for a reason. Beth Spangler says my mother was right. I was always, it seemed, in the middle of it. Well, friends, the gift that God has given in Jesus Christ is the assurance that he is right in the middle of it with you. Whatever you may be going through right now, or someone you love is going through, whatever we may be going through as a nation, a world, whatever cities like El Paso and Dayton may be going through, we need to hold up the truth that Jesus Christ is in the middle of it, and he will see them through. Somehow, some way, he will see them through. Part of being who we are and who we are called to be in these times. This is us, Christ-centered, making sure Jesus is always in the middle of who we are. Secondly, what does it mean to be Christ-centered? It means that Jesus Christ holds the place of prominence. We might say, in this case, center stage. Is Jesus Christ center stage in your life? And does he hold that place of prominence in our life together as a church? So vitally important now, church, the world needs you to be Christ-centered. Because that's who you are. That's who you are. You know, we've been away for a while, and I always tell them my vacations are half vacation, half sabbatical, because when you're in Europe, and especially Italy, you find yourself in all kinds of cathedrals with a quiet space, opportunity to sort of reflect and think and pray, and I enjoy that part of it very much. But in these times in which we live, my mind went back to some years ago, just a moment of personal testimony, if I might. Some years ago, I was set free in my faith and my ministry. Because, you see, I still had a tendency to give in to that genetic flaw that seems to run through the human family. And that's the genetic flaw of really wanting to harshly judge other people. And I, have a little tr- I had a little trouble letting go of that gene. But I finally, kind of like the Greeks here in John 12, decided in my life and my ministry, what do I really want? I want to see Jesus. That's it. I simply want to follow Jesus. That's all. I want to follow Jesus. And friends, for for some of you or some who've known me, following Jesus, when they see me following Jesus, I may be a little bit too liberal for them. Other people, when they see me following Jesus, they might think I'm too conservative. And what I decided back then is that I don't care. I just want to follow Jesus. Get rid of the labels. Get rid of the categories. Get rid of trying to classify someone. And just follow Jesus. And where he leads us is where we'll need to be. You see, preacher, is it that simple? Well, I'm not saying it's simple, but I'm saying that that's the truth. If if we are Christ-centered, Jesus Christ holds the place of prominence. And we follow him. We serve him. We offer his light to all people. Third, Jesus Christ is above all because he's been lifted up. He's above all. That's That's why we can center ourselves on him. Jesus Christ has been lifted up above all people. You understand in that passage of scripture when he says, when I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. And it says, he did this to signify the death he would die. Lifted up means on the cross. They attached the person to the cross, then they lifted it up. So when I am lifted up on the cross, there, my friends, is where we see who God is. There's where we need to center our lives. 
My United Methodist colleague Jim Harnish tells the story of a man in his congregation who had gone through a very difficult time. He'd gone through a difficult time because he had compromised some of his highest ideals and given up some of his most loyal commitments. And as a result of that, he was going through a terrible time of depression and guilt and pain. Harnish says this gentleman was telling him, sharing with him, I've been to see a counselor, I've been in counseling for four or five months now, and something happened to me. Jim said, what's that? He said, well, the other day, out of nowhere, the counselor said to me, do you go to church? And I told him, yes, sir, I do. And he said, the counselor looked at me and said, well, I don't think it's doing any good. I don't know why you're going. And he said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, the way I understand church is... If you believe that Jesus went to the cross for you, then you would quit trying to carry this cross by yourself. And if you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and was risen so that you might be forgiven, it seems to me you might be willing to forgive yourself also and move forward. The gentleman says it was an eye-opener. Unexpected, but an eye-opener. If I really believe that what happened on the cross happened for me, shouldn't it change the way I live? Yes, it should. Shouldn't it change the way I deal with the guilt, the pain, the brokenness in my life? Yes. And friends, it can. When we choose to make our lives Christ-centered and we choose to be a community that's Christ-centered, Jesus Christ becomes above all and his cross speaks that word of transformation for us and for all people. Fourth, what does it mean to be Christ-centered? It means that Jesus Christ being strength brings strength and stability. He brings strength and stability. To have a solid core, we're told, to have a solid center is the key to having strength and stability physically. That is also true spiritually. And friends, at times, life can be harsh. We know that. There's only one person who can bring strength and stability amidst that harshness, and that is Jesus Christ himself. Why? Because he designed life. If he designed life, then he knows about life, and he knows about your life. And so he can bring that strength and stability for you. Some years ago, when I built our cabin in Nicholas County, My father was living, and he helped design the the cabins on the mountain, so it's way above the ability of the public service district water to get to the top, so we had to devise a method to get water to the top of the mountain. Well, my father designed wonderful setup. The pump house is at the bottom of the mountain. He put a shallow well pump in. He wired the electric all down to it. There's two or three junction boxes. He wired it up by the sink. Okay, I'm not going to bore you with details. But just simply to say, above my level of expertise. But my dad designed this whole thing. And then I'll, forget, I'll never forget this a few years ago when that pump went out for the first time. I remember thinking to myself, I wish I could call my dad. Because he designed it. Right? He mapped it out. He would know exactly where the problem was and what to troubleshoot. Well, thankfully, as I looked through my files... My father had made a diagram of the entire setup. We'd left that. And we consulted that diagram, my cousin and I, and we were able to troubleshoot it and fix the problem. Friends, in your own life, why do you struggle on your own? There is one who designed life. He understands it. And so if you're looking for strength and stability, you're looking for a way to continue to move forward, look to him. In Jesus Christ, God has diagrammed it for you. And through his love and through his grace, through centering ourselves on him, we can find the strength and stability we're looking for in life. Finally, what does it mean to be Christ-centered? Jesus provides the balance we need for living. In these times in which we live, it's easy to get out of balance. Our vision becomes blurred. We get buffeted from left and right with winds and storms. All of those things can cause us to stagger and stumble our way through life with with no sense of balance. God wants you to have that balance in your life. 
so that no matter what comes your way, you can experience the fullness of joy that he has for you. Some years ago, I chaperoned a trip of one of my kids to the Carnegie Science uh, Museum in Pittsburgh. And one of the little demonstrations that they did, I'll never forget it, they, they had this set of goggles. And they asked for volunteers from the, the, the school kids to come up to the stage, and they put these goggles on them, and the purpose of the goggles was to sort of simulate what it was to be under the influence. And so they had these thick goggles, and as soon as they lost their sense of vision, they lost their sense of balance. So they would have a kid, they put the goggles on, say, walk from that side of the stage to the other. Well, literally, they staggered along. They couldn't walk in a straight line. They did well to get to the other side of the stage without falling down. Because with the blurred vision of those goggles, they completely lost their balance. And that was a powerful illustration for them. And friends, it should be a powerful illustration to us spiritually. When you choose to look through a lens that is not related to Jesus Christ, you will lose your balance. All of a sudden, you look at everything through that one lens. And instead of experiencing joy and gladness, you experience anxiety and hurt and difficulty because you're looking through that lens rather than the lens that God provides in Jesus Christ. He wants to bring balance to your life. But that will happen when we clearly see the vision of who Jesus Christ is and who he desires for us to be. Friends, this is us. This is us. We're called to be Christ-centered people. We're called to be a Christ-centered church. So moving forward, let us pray together. That God shows us the way to be centered solely and entirely upon the one who gave himself for us. May we be the people, Christ-centered, that God has called us to be. Amen and amen. This morning we're privileged to share in a service of Holy Communion. If you are visiting with us, please know that you are welcome at the table of our Lord. All are welcome. If uh, Holy Communion is not part of your experience, you are welcome. In the Christian community, we partake of this meal as a way of remembering, remembering the love that God has for us in an outward symbolic way uh, each time that we partake of it. I invite those who are assisting with communion to join me at the altar rail at this time. Lord, we give you thanks and praise that continually and constantly you have promised to be our God. In the midst of difficult times, you continue to hold out your love and your grace and your mercy. We rely upon that presence today. Show us the way forward. Show us the way to lean entirely upon your everlasting arms. And today we remember Jesus who came and dwelt among us. On the very night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. When he'd given thanks, he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, This bread is my body broken for you. As oft as ye eat of this bread, do so in remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And when he'd supped, he gave it to his disciples and said, This cup is my blood of the new covenant, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As oft as ye drink of this cup, do so in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts of salvation in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves again as a living sacrifice on his behalf. Show us the way to center our lives entirely upon him, O Lord, that the, that the world might see his light shining through us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us who have gathered here and on these gifts of bread and vine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to the entire world, looking toward the day when we will all feast at your heavenly banquet table. All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen.